Today in reading, we're going to talk about how fantasy writers use information from nonfiction texts to better understand fantasy stories. Um, so you should have this sheet to be glued in. And then the point that I want you to consider today is that while good fantasy writers obviously have a vivid imagination, they have to sprinkle facts into their stories. If you think about why you would want to include real information, true information in a story, it makes sense. You would want to have um, your own world that you're building. It's a fantasy, so it's not real, but it helps people make connections to the real world. So if you think about The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, for example, it's taking place in a time, in a, in a time where there's a war going on in the real world, and people might want to escape that. Um, also, you think about it's taking place during a war, and then there's a war going on in the book as well. If you think about Harry Potter, I mean, Harry Potter could take place at any time, but what makes Harry Potter cool is that at the beginning of the story, he's in a real place where people actually live, and so it makes people really understand that that could be anyone. If you start a fantasy story off in the real world, it really does make you feel like that could happen to you because there's a kid who lived in the real world just like me, and now this is happening to him or her. So there are lots of reasons why good fantasy has some nonfiction sticking points. I'm going to be reading this story today, and I want you to follow along, and then in your notebook here, I want you to jot about how what connections you notice to the real world. The story is called Smoky Mountain Rose, no relation to our rose, of course, and Appalachian Cinderella. So right off the bat, some of you should be writing down, oh, Appalachian, that's a real place. And if you don't know anything about that, you might, if you were reading this book on your own, take a few minutes to look that up and figure out what that's all about. This is a big word. Maybe you weren't even sure how to say it, but Appalachia, the Appalachian Mountains, that's a real place. Smoky Mountains, maybe you've heard of the Smoky Mountains, so Smoky Mountain Rose. You're going to try to take some jots about how this book is fantasy, but how it's also got facts in it. Now listen. Smack in the heart of the old... I'm sorry, smack in the heart of the Smoky Mountains, there was this old trapper living in a log cabin with his daughter. One night, while Rose was frying a mess of fish, the trapper, he starts looking dejected like. I reckon it's hard on you not having a ma, he said. Tell me, Rose, would you like me to get hitched again? There's a widow woman with two daughters down the road apiece. Way I see it, we'd all fit together neater than a jigsaw. I don't mind, said Rose, setting a plate of cornbread on the table. You go a court and paw, if you think it's best. So before the huckleberries were fit for the pickin', the trapper got himself hitched for the second time. That's when the trouble started a brewin. So you might be thinking right now about the way that they're talking. That's a specific dialect. You might be thinking about log cabins. That's a real kind of place that people lived. You see, Gertie, the new wife, she was just about the crossest, fearsomest woman that side of Otar Belly Creek. And her two daughters... Ah, why they were so mean they'd steal flies from a blind spider. And vain, them girls could waste a whole day admiring themselves in the mirror. Ain't I purty? Annie would say, peering into the glass. Not as purty as me, Liza Jane would retort. Y'all watch, someday I'm gonna marry me a fine gentleman, go to Memphis and live like a lady. Rose, on the other hand, was a sweet little thing, always looking out for others and taking care of sick critters and the like. Annie and Liza Jane couldn't stand the sight of her. To be ornery, they dressed her in some sorriest-looking rags and made her plum near, do plumb near every chore. Well, it just about broke the trapper's heart to see his daughter out milking the cow and collecting the firewood and churning the butter. He would have talked to Gertie about it, but talking to her was like kicking an agitated rattler. The trapper figured it was better to say nothing at all. So far, it could just be a regular story. It could be a true story. There's nothing different in it that's happened that makes it fantasy. This went on for a long time. Then one day, the trapper up and died. Rose had loved her paw something fierce, and for days on end, she couldn't stop a weeping. Finally, Gertie lit into her mean as a hornet. Shut up that crying, she screeched, or I'm going to feed you to the dogs, you hear? 
From then on, Rose's life was just about as hard as it could be. Chores from sun up to sun down. Of course, she thought of running away, but she didn't have anywhere to go, so she figured she just had to set out and wait for a better day to come along. Now, it so happens that on the other side of a creek, there was this rich feller made his fortune on sow, so, sow bellies and grits. Well, this feller wasn't hitched yet, so one day he gets the bright idea to invite all the neighbor people to a fancy old party, thinking he might find himself a wife. When Annie and Liza Jane got their invitations, they plumb near went crazy with excitement. I'm going to order me a brand new dress out of that there catalog, Annie declared. No, you ain't, cried Liza Jane. That catalog is mine, you skunk. Take your hands off it. Now Rose, she sort of figured she was invited too. When Annie and Liza Jane heard that, they started a howling. Lord of mercy, who'd want to dance with a dirt clod like you? For the next few days, they worked Rose like they was fixing to kill her. A full hour before the sun was up, she'd be ironing their dresses and polishing their shoes and every other darn fool thing. Now Rose, she wanted to go to the party something awful, but she held her tongue for fear of being laughed at again. So again, so far, this is a realistic story. Girls being mean, getting ready to go to a neighborhood function, think about neighborhood parties. The actual night of the shindig, the two sisters were downright hateful. Hand me that comb, stupid. Tie my hair ribbon. Where's my corset? Rose ran left and right, trying to keep up with their demands. Finally, towards seven o'clock, Gertie and her daughters piled into the tater wagon. Whipping the mule, they went rumbling down the dirt road, cordling out, skipped to Maloo at the top of their lungs. Rose, meanwhile, sat next to the pigsty and cried. Far off, across the creek, she could hear the sound of fiddle music. That made her cry even harder. Just one of them hogs comes moseying up to the fence and starts talking to her. So if you think about this, over here, they're talking about a tater wagon. Um, that's definitely a thing. Think about what that probably is. They're riding a, they're using a mule to haul them. A dirt road. And I know it may seem obvious, but these are real-life facts of a lifetime spent living in the Smoky Mountains. This isn't a fantasy world. So this is what it means by using real details in your fantasy story. Look at that pig snout. Oh. You sure look miserable, honey. But don't you fret none. I know magic, and I can help. See? Now it's a fantasy. Rose just stared, figuring she'd done lost her wits, but the hog kept right on talking. First of all, we gotta get you out of them rags. Now stand up and turn around real fast like you got a wampus cat biting on your britches. Rose did just what the hog told her. When she looked down, she was wearing the prettiest party dress she'd ever laid eyes on. I must be dreaming, she said to herself. The hog studied her real careful like, looking good, sister, but time's a him. We gotta get you over to the shindig. Go fetch me a mushmelon and two field mice. Again, Rose did just what she was told. Now watch, the hog said, and direct, directly the mushmelon was turned into a big old wagon. And the mice, two strong horses with silky manes and shiny tight teeth, real show critters. Rose was thrilled to pieces. She was all set to hop up on the wagon when the hog let out a big snort. Why, look at them filthy bare feet! That won't do at all. Close your eyes. Now open them. Rose looked down. On each foot, she was wearing a sparkling glass slipper. You like them? Asked the hog. Well, said Rose, trying to be polite. They're not too practical for square dancing, but they sure are pretty. The hog watched as Rose climbed up in the wagon. Now don't forget, the spell's only good till midnight, so you gotta be home by then. I'll remember, said Rose. And off she went, a rumbling down the dirt road, just as happy as can be. The shindig was even fancier than she'd reckoned. There were two fiddlers, a harmonica man, and even a square dancer, call, square dance caller, coming all the way from Nashville. Everyone was dancing and laughing and drinking, cup after cup of sarsaparilla. Now the rich feller, he wasn't having such a good time. No one had caught his fancy. See, and then all of a sudden, Rose came in through the big barn door. She looked so pretty that everyone stopped dead in their tracks. The two stepsisters, they practically choked on their cider. Well, shut my mouth, one of them whispered. 
How'd she get in here? Where'd she get them clothes? Gotta wring her neck, snapped the other. She's been going through my boudoir. So think about this. Still a fantasy because she's got this outfit that's crafted by a fairy god pig at this point. But we're talking about a real square dance, which is an event that would have taken place in the Appalachian Mountains. Fiddlers, harmonica men. We're talking about Nashville. We're talking about drinking sarsaparilla. These are not fantasy elements. These are real life elements. They watched, jaws a dropping, as the rich feller went hurrying up to Rose, thrusting out his hand. Pleased to meet you, Missy, he said, real friendly. My name's Seb. How about taking a turn around the dance floor? My pleasure, said Rose, and off they went, arm in arm. Neighbors cleared a space and watched as the two lovebirds started promenading to the tune of Baldy Holler. Eight hands up and go to the left, backwards now and home you go. All evening long, Rose and Seb kicked up their heels, having a high old time. Gertie and her two daughters stood off to the side, madder in blazes. Look at her, sneered Gertie, sashaying around like she's a belly of the ball. I'll fix her when she gets home, give her a list of chores she won't never finish. Just then, Rose happened to glance at the big granddaddy clock in the corner. Tarnation, she cried, it's midnight. Without another word, she went dashing out the barn door. Poor thing was running so fast, one of her glass slippers went flying off into the dirt. She'd have fetched it, but there wasn't worn time. Come back, cried Seb, chasing after her, but Rose's wagon was already rattling down the road as fast as it could go. No sooner was she out of sight than everything turned back to the way it used to be. The wagon was a mushmelon again, and Rose had to walk home dressed in rags. Only thing that hadn't changed was the remaining glass slipper, which she tucked in her pocket for safekeeping. Before going indoors, Rose stopped at the sty to say thank you. Any time, sugar, said the hog. Now Gertie and her daughters, they came tearing home about ten minutes later. Rose was already asleep by the fire. Ain't you gonna whip her now, Ma? said Liza Jane. My whipping arm is tired. I'll do it tomorrow, said Gertie. You gals get to bed now and get your beauty sleep. Don't you worry. There'll sure be fireworks in the morning. Sure enough, the next day, Gertie lit into Rose something awful. Showing up at that party making my girls look like fools, she screeched. I'll learn ya. Grabbing the switch, she was all set to whip Rose when her two daughters came flying up the hill. Listen, Ma, cried Annie. That rich feller, he found Rose's shoe in the dirt, and now he's going around to every house to find the owner. And that ain't all, said Liza Jane. That feller, Ma, he's plumb crazy. He says he's getting hitched to the first person that fits on, and I reckon it's going to be me. Well, hurry up, then, and get ready, said Gertie. And listen, y'all, whichever of you gets the wedding ring and moves to Memphis, I'm coming along. You ain't even leaving behind, leaving me behind. Then, turning to Rose, Gertie warned, You stay out of sight, or I'll blister your rump something fierce. Half an hour later, Seb came rattling up the road in his wagon. Gertie was there, waiting on the porch, suck shucking peas. Why is it that the... Pig and Grits feller. Why, oh, sorry. Why, it's the Pig and Grits feller, she said, acting real surprised. Come on in and set a spell. Understand you found my daughter's shoe. Before Seb had even said howdy-do, Anne came flying out of the porch, sticking out her foot. Me first, she yelled, setting herself on the big, setting herself down on the big milk bucket. Now Seb, he commences to tugging and pulling, but getting the slipper under her big foot was like trying to stretch a little bitty sausage skin over a side of beef. Get out of my way, said Liza Jane, pushing her sister aside. And right away, she starts a batting her eyes at Seb. I want to thank you for returning my shoe, she says. I about fell into a fidget of fear when I saw it was gone. But Seb could tell she was just sweet talking. The minute the tugging started, Liza Jane pert near went blue in the face. Let me get the axe, she said aghast him. I'll get that shoe on if it kills me. Just then, Seb spotted Rose standing off near the pigsty. Weren't you at the shindig last night? He called out. Rose went on feeding the hogs like she didn't hear him. Come over here and stick out your foot, Seb told her. He watched as Rose came a walking toward him. You look mighty familiar, missy. Come on now, just set yourself down on this here bucket and stick out your tootsie. Annie and Liza Jane held their breath as Rose stretched out her pretty little foot. Now hold still, Seb told her, and wouldn't you know it, the slipper went gliding right on, just as smooth as butter. 
When Gertie saw that, she started to screech him. That weasel! She's a trick you. Why, my daughters are a heap prettier than her. But Seb, he didn't pay her no mind. Happy as a pig in a peanut patch, he took her Rose's hand and held it high. I knew I'd find ye, he whispered, and Rose nodded all teary-eyed. Then remembering the other slipper, she took it out of her pocket and put it on. Very same moment, the hog started snorting and kicking up a fuss. When Rose looked down again, she was wearing the exact same dress she'd had on at the shindig, looking purty as blue bonnets in spring. Upon seeing that, the two stepsisters, they done burst into tears. Our precious little sister gone be buried into money! And set to fussing over her like they just loved her to pieces. Now Rose, she could have turned her back on him, but she didn't. Sweet thing, she figured it was best to forgive and forget. I love you like soup loves salt, she told him. And from then on, Annie and Liza Jane never gave her a moment of grief or heartache. And the wedding that followed? Well, it was just about the biggest shindig ever seen in the Smoky Mountains. To this day, Rose and Seb are still living there, and folks reckon they're about the happiest twosome in all of Tarbelly Creek. So you should have written down some notes, either what I was saying or what you were noticing, about how understanding the real world can help you understand a fantasy story. Because certainly Smoky Mountain Rose is a fantasy story, because hogs don't become fairy god hogs and give you fancy shoes for your shindig. So you've got some notes written down. What I want you to do is I want you to pay special attention today while you are reading your nonfiction book, or sorry, while you're reading your fantasy book about if there are any nonfiction elements there. And today's jot is optional. If there's anything happening in your book that you feel like um, in the real world that you need to know more about, you can fill out this jot. But as it says here, it's optional, so you don't necessarily have to do that. But I do want you to pay special attention to elements from the real world, whether they be like present day real world or in the past. So if your book takes place in the past in a fantasy world, you might choose to research um, that time period. Or if your fantasy starts off in a real place and you want to know more about it. Or if your fantasy starts off with real people in the real world, like real characters, famous people, maybe you want to research those. So, your two choices today. You're going to read your fantasy book for the rest of reading today. You can either just think and jot about real world elements, or you can actually think about something that you want to learn more about and then research it. That's up to you.